of time, let's get things started. Welcome back to the Federal Indian Gaming Law class. As you know, today we have guest speakers. We have Danny DiRenzo from GeoComply. He's the Senior Director of Government Relations at GeoComply. And we have Gabrielle Angles. So she's here uh, also a Manager of Regulatory Compliance at GeoComply and a proud alumnus of the Boyd School of Law. And so with that, I think I'll turn things over and uh, let Danny and Gabrielle uh, run the show from here on out. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, I also, in case any of you students are interested, am the UNLV Alumni Association president. So when That's you right. graduate, if you graduate this year or next year, I will be your Alumni Association president. Um, so just a little fun fact there. And I always like to brag about Danny, who spent 22 years in the Secret Service. So he's got quite the, the background there as well. Um, but Danny, if you want to go ahead and share, we'll, we'll get started. I can do that. Oh, and Danny's also a former regulator from the Tennessee Lottery. So he's like done the other side yes. of this too. <laughs> yes. And just to clarify, I am not an attorney, but during my career, I've spent enough time around him that I feel like I am one. Um, and I sort of came into the gaming world uh, via the law enforcement route. So a little, little bit different route than Gabrielle. Can everybody see the screen now? Can you see that, Gabrielle? Yeah, I can okay. see it, yeah. Yeah, so, well, we are thrilled to be here today. Um, I have been talking to Greg about doing a, a presentation for the class for a very long time, and I'm glad we could finally get it together. And I'm even happier that we've got Danny here who um, works so closely with regulators and our technology and, and what we can do. Um, so I handle the licensing side of things and the internal due diligence processes. I manage all of our gaming licenses and Danny really works closely with um, government and regulators to share the information and make sure that, that they have all the tools they need to be successful understanding our technology as well. So we'll cover a few things today, um, just an intro to who we are, why we do what we do, how we do it. Uh, we've got a demo for you that is all, um, always really well received by the public. They think it's really cool. And then we'll talk a little bit about our internship program, um, just in case any of you might be interested or know someone who's interested as well. So um, there was, um, I, you know, the history of, of online gaming um, goes back over a decade now, really. Um, but, you know, it's, um, there's a growth fueled by the need for accurate geofencing technology. That's what we do. We hold a, most of the market in geolocation compliance. And uh, so, you know, you, you look at going up to all the way on the right side, the U.S. regulated gaming has up to a million unique users per week. And um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the federal and, and uh, state laws that make it quite necessary <laughs> for operators to ensure that um, this, the bets that they accept are placed from a device that is located physically within the jurisdiction that they're wanting to place that bet. So, and we have, um, you'll see below, we've got several different um, products that we offer depending on the, route, the industry that we're working on. So you see, we've, we work with streaming, e-commerce, fintech, um, we support a lot of the lotteries and skill-based games, including daily fantasy sports as well. You'll see DraftKings is one of our biggest customers. We also, of course, FanDuel as well. Um, we're, we're branching into some international markets. Our bread and butter is the U.S. gaming market as well. So we'll click to the next slide, Danny. Yeah, and just to add something real quick, oh, sure. Gabrielle, sorry. The, yeah, no, the, the range of products that we offer that you see at the bottom, it's, it's it really doesn't mean much to you, but essentially it, 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 it is designed to be industry specific, depending on how heavily regulated that industry is, right? So the world of online gaming, whether it's iGaming, um, sports wagering, is obviously heavily regulated. So in that space, we offer very, uh, very precise 
solutions to do precision compliance grade geolocation. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, uh, the lottery industry, uh, even daily fantasy sports is less regulated. So we have other solutions specifically designed uh, towards, towards the regulations in those industries. Um, this is just a, a little timeline of our history in, in the gaming industry. So we launched with New Jersey. Our company was formed in 2012. We were ready to launch when New Jersey launched in 2013. Um, not a whole lot happened between that and 2018 as far as more states coming online. As you all know, Supreme Court overturned PASPA in 2018, which just opened the market for flooding. Um, and, and I think we went from being licensed in one state to do gaming license or to, to support gaming. Uh, we are now licensed in 22 jurisdictions. Um, and that's just where we have to be licensed. There are some jurisdictions that we are not required. We are as a supplier are not required to be licensed in, um, but operators are. So we as a supplier are licensed in 22 jurisdictions. We support more than that. But you'll see um, PASPA was overturned in 2018. And if you just take a quick look, you'll see Pennsylvania jumped on um, Mississippi sports wagering on property. We have an on property solution. It's actually a hardware beacon that we can talk about later. So if there's tribes or even in Pennsylvania, um, you can't place a bet on a casino property. We can't place a mobile bet on a casino property. Um, or if there's a casino that's really close to a state border and they, they want to allow people to place a bet within the casino, but there's a, a buffer zone with the, the um, technology, we can put that there. You'll see Michigan came on, Virginia came on, West Virginia, Colorado, uh, Iowa, Oregon, Indiana, all of that. I mean, there's just so many states and there's, I don't even think half the states have sports wagering online yet. And so we're expecting um, in the next few years to see that possibly double in size. We are, yeah. we're certainly preparing for that from a licensing standpoint. So we go into every new jurisdiction that opens up. We support, as you saw on the, the last page, every major platform provider, online operator, sports book, um, we support them in some way. And so we, we go wherever they go, no matter where it is, we go wherever they go and, and every new jurisdiction that opens will be there. Yeah, and this slide, um, apologies, we haven't updated it, but even since the, the beginning of 2022, we've launched two big markets in New York and Louisiana. Um, and New York quickly became the biggest market in the U.S. in terms of in terms of everything, in terms of volume of geolocation transactions, in terms of gross handle, uh, number of players. I mean, almost every metric, um, New York was number one. But interestingly, when Louisiana launched uh, just a couple of weeks after New York, um, if you broke it down, uh, the number of users, the number of geolocation transactions uh, on a per capita basis, uh, Louisiana was actually uh, a little bit more actively engaged uh, in sports wagering than, than New Yorkers were. And, and we're and actually, ready, sorry. I was gonna say, speaking about Louisiana, I, I'm sure some of you or all of you might've seen the, the Mattress King guy in Texas who placed a very large bet on the Super Bowl. And actually, if you if you read the article about it, he drove across the border to Louisiana to place his bet online. It was shortly after the Louisiana market had opened and he drove from Texas to Louisiana, just across the border, got on his phone, placed his bet and came back. And we are getting ready um, to launch several more markets this year. The, the, the next one up uh, is going to be actually Ontario, Canada, and that's that's going to be a big market as well. Yeah, and, and Puerto Rico will follow shortly. We're going through that process with Puerto Rico as well. And um, Ohio has got some legislation uh, or regulations that they're they're doing a comment period on. So we're waiting for that to open up for licensing. Um, you know, there's a, a Maryland's numerous coming. tribes that we're waiting to, to for them to decide if they can or want to do anything. So it's there's still so many more jurisdictions that can and will come online. Um, so it we like I said we are we hold the market share in in geolocation and what we do we you'll see here again this is a more comprehensive list every platform provider operator that you can think of um, and, and maybe can think of we support them we um, you know we understand our founders knew how important this technology would be and they chose to to 
focus on geolocation versus any other type of technology that would need to that would be needed to support the online world. Um, and so we, you know, you see here we we cover iGaming, sports betting, iLottery, DFS, um, where we support a few customers over in Europe. We are going into South America, as Danny mentioned. We're getting ready to launch in Ontario. Um, we're looking at Asia as well. We have, you know, someone who's really handling our international markets at the moment. You know, getting us more customers over there as well. So we're we're everywhere. We're international. By the way, guys, we we probably should have mentioned this at the beginning, but I hope this is going to be interactive. So if anybody has any questions at any point, please feel free to interrupt us and jump in. Yeah, please do. And and we'll always take, we'll have time for questions at the end as well, if you want to wait, but you're, you're welcome to unmute yourself and just start talking. Um, <clears throat> since, you know, this is a law class. Um, so as we mentioned, it is critical for operators to abide by federal and state geolocation requirements. Um, the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act prohib prohibits interstate wagers. The Wire Act prohibits interstate sports betting. I know there's been some back and forth opinions on that. I believe we're back to now. It justifies the sports wagering um, for the Wire Act. So, you know, these operators, they've, they've got so many different laws that they have to follow um, so that they don't get in trouble. They don't get sued. They don't get fined. They don't get shut down. And our technology helps them do that. We have pinpoint accurate technology. Um, we geofence out, uh, you know, if you're within a state, we geofence those borders. And, um, you know, some state specific requirements that I always find really interesting. There are like in DC, there are federal lands in DC that we have to geofence out because it's still federally, you know, these federal laws are in place. You cannot place an online bet on federal lands. And so there are, are lands in DC that we have to just geofence out from the map. Um, so you cannot place a bet within those bounds. Tribal lands, you know, depending on the tribal state compact, if that tribe wants to have you know, if wants to have their own um, betting or, or sports wagering on their on their land. I remember seeing a while back a map of Oregon, you know, where we support the Oregon lottery. And there were these tiny little pockets of tribal lands in Oregon that we had to geofence out because you can't place a bet on tribal lands in Oregon. Um, there's, you know, and there's there's standards that will come out state by state, depending on the relationship with the tribes and, and what they've agreed upon in their compacts that there are oftentimes we have to, to fence out those tribal lands. Uh, Louisiana is a perfect example. Not every parish legalized sports wagering in Louisiana. So I think it was 56 out of the six, there's 50, I don't know, but there's like nine or two, nine and 11 parishes that did not legalize it. So all of those parishes have to be fenced out for our operators in Louisiana because you cannot place a bet within the parishes that did not legalize sports wagering. Um, so it's it gets so intricate and so detailed, but it has to be because you can't operate a sports book or an online casino um, and not be able to follow these laws. So. Yeah, and Gabrielle, just to add to that real quick, another example of a, of a complicated state would be Connecticut. And in Connecticut, they have statewide mobile sports wagering uh, with three operators, one run by the state and then two commercial operators. And they're all, all three of them are clients of ours. They also have two uh, uh, tribal reservations, two tribes, uh, the Mashantucket Pequot mm -hmm. tribe that runs the Foxwood Casino on their tribal lands. And then there's Mohegan Sun. Uh, the Mohegan Sun tribe, which runs the Mohegan Sun casino on their tribal lands. Within those tribe, those two tribal lands, they offer on reservation iGaming, not sports wagering, iGaming. So we've got two independent operators contracted with the two tribes to run iGaming on the two tribal lands, on the two reservations, and then you've got statewide mobile. So we've got a complex uh, geofence system set up where only certain areas can you are you allowed to place mobile sports bets, and in on, only on on reservation are you allowed to place um, you know i gaming wagers. Um, so that would be another example of a, a complicated setup for us. Yeah, you can click to the next one, Dan. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. You're in control, buddy. Oh, now I'm on. <clears throat> this is I your time. Hear from me. So uh, try and stay awake. I'll try not to bore you too much. But now we're going to get into the portion of uh, Gabrielle talked about why we do it. You know, all these uh, federal laws, state regulations, state laws. Uh, let's talk about how we do it. 
Um, everybody's familiar with some commercial applications that uses some sort of geolocation technology, right? Uh, I'm sure you've all grabbed an Uber at some point, maybe ordered a Starbucks online and it somehow knows where your closest Starbucks is, right? That is some form of geolocation technology that they're using on the back end for those commercial applications. Huge difference between what the Ubers of the world do and what we do. Frankly, Uber really doesn't care if you're trying to spoof your location, if you're trying to fake where you are, if you're trying to make it look like you're in a state where it's legal to place a sports wager when you're really not. Uber doesn't care. They're going to charge you regardless, right? We have to care. So the big difference between what those commercial applications do and what we do is the manner in which we geolocate a device. And I'll talk about in a minute um, the interrogation that we put that data through before we decide whether or not we're going to trust where you are, where you say you are, where your device says it is. So there's the uh, one of the other key differences is we use multiple data sources to geolocate a device, right? Whether you're on your cell phone, your laptop, an iPad, whatever, we're going to use uh, as many sources, data sources as we can to triangulate your position. The first data source we use is uh, GSM or cell tower triangulation. Um, now, what this does is it basically takes the uh, signal strength uh, of the of at least three cell towers uh, that your device is pinging off of and um, triangulates your position based on the location, a combination of the location of those cell towers and the signal strength that your phone is receiving from those towers um, or your iPad. Uh, cell tower triangulation uh, is the uh, least common form of uh, geolocation data source that we use. And the reason is it's, it's fairly inaccurate. Uh, you can see there the accuracy average is between 900 yards and two and a half miles. Uh, if you're wagering in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, which is pretty much dead center of the state, um, and we are only able to locate your position based on cell tower triangulation, we're probably going to accept that because a two and a half mile radius, we are still very confident that you're nowhere near the border of Indiana. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in Memphis, Tennessee, which literally sits on the Mississippi River and borders two other states within less than a mile, uh, and the only data source we're able to get is cell tower triangulation, we are not going to pass that geolocation transaction because that accuracy radius is just too big and could potentially put that device outside of the state of Tennessee. Did I skip a couple? The next one we use is uh, GPS triangulation. GPS triangulation is the most accurate form of geolocation uh, data sources that we have in terms of the accuracy radius. We can get it down to meters. If you're very close to the border, we're probably gonna rely on GPS. GPS uh, triangulation. It is not actually the most common data source we use. And the reason is, is well, there's several reasons. One, uh, it tends to drain the battery of the device pretty quickly uh, if we're constantly using GPS signals. Uh, two, we cannot always get a good GPS signal. It relies on satellite triangulation. And so if you're in the basement of a building, for example, or maybe in the middle of Manhattan where there's a lot of tall buildings blocking line of sight to satellites, um, that accuracy radius is going to increase pretty rapidly because we just can't get a good GPS signal. Lastly, uh, if you're on a desktop or a last laptop, uh, GPS is not an option, right? It's only for mobile devices at this point. Um, so it is not the most common uh, form of data uh, that we use to geolocate a device, but it is the most accurate. It's actually the second most common. The, the, the most common form is Wi-Fi triangulation. And Wi-Fi triangulation essentially is the same, is the same principle. Signal strength uh, coupled with the locations of the Wi-Fi access points. And so you don't even have to be connected to Wi-Fi as long as your device is scanning those Wi-Fi access points. We can triangulate your position based off of that. It's the second most accurate. It's a little less accurate usually than, than GPS. Uh, but it is the most common data source that we use. Um, really, the, the, there's only a couple of instances where uh, Wi-Fi triangulation would not be an option for us. And that tends to be like in really rural areas, like in rural Pennsylvania, for example, or Wyoming, which has legal sports wagering. Uh, you may not be able, your device may not be scanning multiple Wi-Fi access points. 
Um, so then we would have to revert to either GPS or um, cell tower triangulation. So those are the three data sources that we use. Now let's talk about IP. Uh, IP uh, internet protocol addresses are used in a lot of different solutions across many industries. Um, and they're actually very valuable in terms of conducting investigations, which is where my background is in fraud investigations. Um, we can, you know, if you get a static IP address, meaning it's assigned to a uh, Wi-Fi network or, or residential um, internet service, uh, we can always subpoena that internet service provider, get the subscriber information and develop suspects off of an IP address. In terms of geolocation though, while we, while we collect IP, and I'll talk in a minute about how we interrogate it. Uh, we do. We never use IP uh, to geolocate, and the reason is it's wildly inaccurate. You can see here the. Re I mean, literally, when when we geolocate off of IP address, we we come down to basically a city and a state, and it could be 50 miles uh, accuracy radius, which really would, if we relied on IP, would take out a large portions of of a lot of states in terms of trying to allow people to wager. The second reason is it's too easy to spoof, you know, VPNs, proxies, Tor network, whatever. It's it's too easy for people to spoof your, where, your location based solely on IP. Um, so while we collect it and we interrogate it um, to see if we can trust the data, we do not use it to geolocate a device. Hey, so let's Danny, talk we, about. Danny, I'm we sorry. Have a question in the chat, real quick. That awesome. relates back to what we use. Um, so Morgana is asking, do we combine GPS and Wi-Fi or is it just one or the other? Like when we pull those sources, do we combine them together to get a location or do we use them as separate data sources to just confirm the accuracy? That is a, that's a great question. And what we will do is we, if we collect both, we will analyze both for location, right? If we only get one, then we'll just use that one as long as it safely puts that device inside the inclusion zone, which is what we would call, like, for example, the state of Tennessee, um, to make sure that you're in Tennessee to place a, a wager on a Tennessee sports book. Um, so if we collect more than one, like we can go into our back office and see every geolocation transaction that we conduct, right? And if let's say it says Wi-Fi and GPS, it'll then tell us the location based off of both of those data sources, right? And if they don't match, like if one says Memphis, Tennessee, and the other one says Little Rock, Arkansas, then we're gonna fail that transaction. Does that make sense? So yes, that's a great question. We will collect all the data sources we can, um, but we only have to rely on one as long as it safely puts them in the inclusion zone. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for asking the question. So let's talk about, I keep talking about interrogating the data, right? Making sure we can trust it. Uh, Uber doesn't care if you say you're in, you know, on Las Vegas Boulevard and you're really on Flamingo Boulevard, right? Is there even a Flamingo? Did I get that right, Gabrielle? I did. Yeah, right? Yes, yes, you I've did. Been you're Vegas learning quickly. Week. I'm learning my way around. Uh, they don't care. They're going to bill your credit card anyway, right? We have to care uh, because we need not only Gabrielle talked a lot about compliance, right? And geolocation is for compliance and making sure you're with it. You're not in violation or our, our clients are not in violation of the Federal Wire Act or UGA. We also wanna make sure that we are, we are a business, right? And we are trying to maximize uh, profits for our clients. So we want to allow as many people to play as we can, as close to the border as we can. Uh, and that's why we keep talking about precision geolocation. If we can get to within meters of the border and allow people to play, we're doing our job perfectly. Uh, there are a lot of heavy population areas very close to borders that if we weren't able to geolocate down to meters, we would exclude a lot, lot of potential customers for our clients. So that's why it's so important that we interrogate the data. And when I say that, what I mean is we are looking at the user. We're looking to see if that user has been blocked for fraud before. Have they engaged in trying to spoof their location before? Um, are they have they engaged in proxy betting before, anything like that, that would cause us not to trust that, that player. We're looking at IP. I told you we don't use IP to geolocate a device, but we do use it to ensure that we can trust the data. So is it, is it a VPN, is it an IP address associated with a VPN, the Tor network, a proxy server, 
any of those things, we're going to deny that geolocation transaction. And then we look at device intent. All right, is it a rooted or jailbroken device? Are you running any sort of virtual machines, uh, remote desktops? Do you have fake location applications on the device? We're doing that device level check to make sure that the device itself can be trusted. In fact, as the slide says, we do over 350 checks on a device in milliseconds before we ever are even gonna geolocate. And only after a device passes all these checks and a player passes all these checks, are we then gonna go ahead and use that data that I talked about to geolocate the device. If, if that device or the player fails any of these 350 checks, then the geolocation transaction will fail. Now, let me be clear on something. 99, in my experience, 99.9% of all people who place wagers in the United States, who visit sports books, who visit iCasinos, are doing it for legitimate reasons. They're there for entertainment value. They're there to place legitimate wagers. Um, but there is fraud that goes on, and that's what we're trying to help prevent. So when somebody fails a geolocation check, depending on the reason, but let's say it's you're on your work laptop or your school laptop, and you have to connect to a VPN to get into your class or to drop off an assignment to your professor, whatever it might be, or you have to connect to a VPN to get into your, your work's email. And then you just all of a sudden bounce over to DraftKings, for example, and, and try and place a wager on DraftKings, and you forget to get to exit out of that VPN that you're already connected to. That is not an attempt to spoof location, right? And we actually immediately will send uh, a troubleshooter message, basically saying, hey, we just saw that you tried to log into DraftKings, please disable your VPN and try again. And so by doing that, we are basically trying to treat everybody as if they're part of that 99.9% of people who are just trying to have fun, entertainment, place a legitimate wager. We also don't lose anything if we're actually dealing with one of those 0.1% fraudsters, because if we start sending them troubleshooter messages and they don't disable their VPN or they don't uh, turn on their location services, for example, so that we can get a GPS uh, signal, then we're just never gonna pass them, right? And we'll eventually stop sending them those troubleshooter messages. But we have a tremendous amount of success with troubleshooter messaging to the legitimate population with them then being able to comply with, OK, I forgot to turn off my VPN. Let me turn it off. I'm going to try again. OK, now I successfully passed and I can place that that wager that I wanted to place. Um, the troubleshooter messages, the more specific they are, uh, the better it is, because then we can actually give almost instant feedback to the player as to what they need to do. And we actually see a new markets that launch the pass fail rates in terms of, you know, how, what percentage of players are passing uh, geolocation transactions versus what percent are failing. They start off relatively low. And when I say low, like we maybe like a seven, eight, 9% geolocation fail rate, which means, you know, you're talking about 92, 93% of the players passing, but usually there's an education period for new players where they start getting these troubleshooter messages and they realize, Oh, yeah, I got to get out of my VPN. I got to turn my location services on. I got to enable Wi-Fi. And once that education period kind of progresses after a few weeks, you see that pass rate really increase. Um, we're really we're looking for upward north of 97% pass rates. Hey, Danny, we've got a couple questions in the chat. Good, because um, I'm sick of talking already. <laughs> so Courtney's asking, has our geolocation technology ever failed that we know of? And a transaction was authorized that should not have been. So, Courtney, that's an excellent question. And I will tell you that uh, part of my job involves testifying before state legislatures that are considering passing uh, some sort of statewide mobile wagering. Right. And I can promise you that there's always one legislature, no matter what committee I'm before, one legislator, no matter what committee I'm before who is anti-sin. I mean, they just, no matter what you say, they are never going to support wagering. And that's okay. Like, I, I get it. That's a fair position to have. I'm not going to debate that. Um, but that is always the question they want to know. Instead of just saying, hey, I will never support this regardless. You know, I'm, I'm opposed to wagering. I don't believe in it. Um, they will always try and attack, well, you can't guarantee federal wire act compliance, right? 
there's gun. You, you, you can't tell me that there's a hundred percent accuracy on this stuff. And no, I can't, I would never represent that. And you, I think you saw on the slide that Gabrielle presented, um, UGA specifically carves out, you know, you have to take reasonable, you have to incorporate reasonable methods to ensure that the wager is not crossing state lines. Right. And I think what we do actually goes beyond reasonable and almost goes to the level of insanity. That when you're talking about conducting 350 checks, uh, we have historical risk engines that we put all the player data through. I shouldn't say all the player data. We don't have the player data, but the player anonymized account number that we have, right? The device. And that, it, that historical risk engine is built on the back of billions of geolocation transactions. Um, so we, we go far beyond what our legal requirements are to ensure that that wager is, is occurring within a state. Um, but I would never represent that uh, somebody hasn't been able to wager uh, from outside the state. And, but I will also tell you this, when it does happen, um, and again, there's, you know, I mean, how do you prove a negative, right? Like, if we don't know about it, we may never know about it. And I can't, and the question I always get from the legislators are, well, can you tell me that if we pass this, uh, every bet's going to be within this, like I'll give you Arkansas as an example. I testified there last month and they just passed statewide mobile. But the same, this question, yeah, every bet in Arkansas, if we pass this, is going to be from within the state of Arkansas. I mean, you're asking me to predict the future, right? I, I, I can't do that. Uh, and I'm not going to do that. But the, a lot of times, if we do have some sort of breakdown, uh, it is not actually the geolocation system that's failing. It is some sort of integration uh, failure with, with the operator's platform. Uh, it is some human error where, you know, a box was unchecked that shouldn't have been in, in their systems configurations. Um, almost always, and it doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, it's almost always us that identifies the problem and goes back to the operator and says, hey, this, you, you got an issue. We need to check your configuration. But excellent question. And you should run for state representative somewhere because you, you would. <laughs> um, Danny, the next question is from Alex. <clears throat> he says, are VPNs the only red flags that can come up in these geolocation checks? What are some other common intentional or willful strategies that you've seen to change one's location? That is a really good question. Who asked that? Alex? Alex. Nice, nice job. So if you, if you can see my slide uh, and it, it's, it's probably kind of small. I actually need my glasses to read it, but you can see a whole litany uh, of things. And this isn't everything, right? Uh, that we look for uh, on a device um, to make sure that we can trust where the, the data that we're receiving. Um, I think right now, we just saw a slide yesterday um, in terms of our data, um, IP anonymizers, whether it's VPNs or proxy source, uh, servers, are the most common um, potential spoofing method that we see. And I think that speaks more to the world that we're all living in right now than it does to, you know, fraudsters really attempting uh, to spoof their location. Uh, the second most common that we see are some sort of fake location applications. Uh, you know, you download that app spoof my location or whatever on your device and you go in there and say, hey, I want it to, I want to make it look like uh, I am actually in Nevada when I'm really in um, South Carolina so I can place a wager. Uh, that's the second most common. So we actually have um, a threat matrix and I'll actually, while I'm speaking, I'll, I'll pull it up and I can show you a sample of this. Um, we call it a suspicious activity report. It is not to be confused with the Bank Secrecy Act and um, SARS suspicious activity reports that are filed by financial institutions or casinos or whoever. Um, it is a, a report that details. Um, hold on one second. Uh, attempts to spoof one's location. And I'm going to show you a sample of it right now. This is a great question, Alex. Okay, so can everybody see, can you see the SAR, Gabrielle? Okay, 
So Alex, what this is, is this is a, a report that we send out uh, to regulators and operators, sports books, iGaming platforms, um, that details attempts to spoof your location. And it goes, for, and we, we actually color code it based on the threat that we perceive. Uh, and it goes from yellow, which is the lowest threat, all the way up to red, which is the highest threat. And what we do when we get a red is we, we block either that device or the user account number or both. Uh, because, and the threat is determined based on several factors, including does this player have a history with us to, uh, of trying to spoof their location? How many different methods are they employing to try and spoof their location? You know, are they using a fake location app and a VPN? Um, what kind of sophistication that, that spoofing method involves? Is it highly sophisticated? Or is it, not, is it simply a VPN, right? Uh, and then lastly, um, even if we detect a lot of these, uh, these spoofing uh, methods on a device, sometimes we're still able to uh, locate that device. And one of the big factors in determining threat level on this is, are they actually in the state that they're trying to wager in, right? Because if they are, it really doesn't make sense that they're intentionally trying to spoof their location because they're actually in Tennessee when they're trying to uh, place a bet on a Tennessee sports book. So we, we factor that into our threat level coding as well. That was a long answer to a short question, but it was a great question. Do we have another one, Gabriella? Was that it for now? That's it for now. But I, I, when I see them, I pull them up and I find a place to interrupt you. So, so students, please continue dropping your questions in, and I'll, I'll pull them up. Okay. Let's go to an, a demo, and let's see this stuff actually work. <clears throat> Greg, what time do we need to finish? Generally, uh, about 8.45. Oh, okay. So we got plenty of time. Plenty of time. All right. Awesome. Uh, okay. Can everybody see the pin drop map? Yes. Okay. So this is our pin drop map. And this is actually the state of New York for those that, of you that didn't recognize it, if you didn't. Um, and what you're seeing is real-time geolocation transactions occurring for players attempting to access or place a wager on a New York sports book. And you can see the pins are different colors. Um, so the white pins represent mobile devices running iOS operating systems. So we're talking about basically iPhones and iPads. Uh, the green pins represent devices running an Android operating system. So we're talking about uh, any, any cell phone and, and their mobile devices. So tablets or phones running Android. And the blue pins represent desktops or PCs, uh, laptops, desktops. Uh, and then the red pins, which we just saw the first one, are geolocation failures. Those are transactions that we have failed. And you can see, looking at this, Manhattan and Buffalo pretty much rule, I shouldn't say Manhattan, uh, the lower New York area pretty much rules the day in terms of volume. Every time a pin drops, that is us actually uh, conducting a geolocation transaction on a device. And if I click on it, you can see here, this one is actually in Stamford, Connecticut. You can see it's red and it just disappeared on me. So let's try this one. Also in Connecticut, it's an iPhone. We tell you uh, the version of iOS operating system it's running. And then the accuracy is greater than the distance between the device and the exclusion zone. So basically, whatever source we used, data source we used to locate this device, uh, the accuracy radius was so big that we could not confidently tell that they were definitively inside the state of New York. Here's one up here in New Haven. The user does not appear to be with an inclusion zone. Remember, the inclusion zone in this case would be the state of New York, so clearly this user is outside of the state. So they are failing that geolocation transaction. Same thing down here, it does not appear to be within the inclusion zone. That's obvious, right? It gets a little more tricky when you are really close to the border. Uh, I'm gonna go up to Buffalo for a second.
And sometimes you'll see, like in this case, it looks like there's a passing Android device right here that's actually closer to the border than this one that's failing. And why is that? Can anybody take a guess why you think that is? After everything we've said today, anybody have a guess why somebody closer to the border might pass and somebody further away from the border might fail? Come on, there's no wrong answer here. Make something up. I'm going to pick on somebody then. Don't pick on them. Right. Here's the reason. There could be several reasons. Okay. One, it's based on the data source, right? I told you before, like some data sources have really wide accuracy ranges and some are very tight. So like maybe that red one that failed that was further away from the border, the only data source we had was cell tower triangulation, which could have up to like a two and a half mile accuracy radius. And maybe the one that's closer to the border that passed, we were actually able to get GPS data from and, and get that accuracy radius down to like five meters. Um, so that, that could be one reason. Other reasons are maybe they're on a blocked list because they've engaged in some sort of fraud before. Uh, and fraud could be anything from uh, location fraud to somebody that has been identified as committing credit card fraud. Identity theft is big in, 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 in digital gaming as it is in all e-commerce verticals. Um, People steal identities, open up a bunch of accounts, and it's usually um, in association with bonus abuse. They're trying to abuse some sort of bonuses that the, the operator is offering. So that that's it could be any of those reasons. Any questions on the pin drop map? If I zoom out, sometimes we see even things from uh, overseas trying. Um, and I actually have, Gabrielle, if you can... Um, speak for a couple minutes. I have one more demo to pull up, but I didn't think to do it before we um, jumped on. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, so, well, I, I mean, I'm always, I always love hearing Danny talk about this because he's so good at it. But um, if there's any additional questions, we're happy to take them right now while Danny pulls up the next demo. Um, the, so as I was mentioning, um, yeah, Courtney, please go ahead. Sorry, right, just real quick. If someone like lives in a zone, uh, like in an inclusion zone, but it's right on the border um, and it's not being recognized by your technology, like what can they do? Can they, are they just out of luck? They'd have to go somewhere else um, or can they come um, you? I'll, I'll take a stab at answering and then Danny can correct okay. anything I say. But um, so we do have for each of the three different um, types of location information that we pull from cell towers to Wi-Fi to GPS, we have what we we call a buffer zone. At every border, we have a buffer zone that is um, a certain distance depending on the, the type of location information that we're pulling. And so if they're within that buffer zone, typically that geolocation transaction is going to fail because um, it's, you know, it's just too risky to pass it knowing that it's it's that close to the border, right? You know, it's it's not perfect. This technology is, is not perfect. It's great. It's it's necessary. It's highly accurate, but it's not going to be perfect because sometimes we have to make decisions um, to you know to create those buffer zones close to those state borders or those jurisdictional borders to completely ensure you know to the best of of our ability and the operator's ability that they're not accidentally accepting a transaction that might be just across the border, but could still be detected within that, that state. Um, and so if it's, if you're paying, the cell tower obviously is the widest buffer zone because that's the least accurate data that, that we can collect. So if it's the cell tower they're picking up and they're within that buffer zone, that's a bigger buffer zone for them to fail in. If that's why they're failing and they can turn on GPS, there's a chance that you know, it's a smaller buffer zone for GPS because that is the most accurate data that, that we can pull. So if they can, if we can locate them by GPS, then there is a chance that even within that same spot, they could potentially pass. Um, it would really just depend on, on where they're standing in the buffer zone. Yeah, and that's that's a good question. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, we actually, in my experience, we actually have more issues with players in rural areas than we do with border play. Um, and, and I apologize. I was, I was pulling this up, so I didn't hear your entire answer, Gabrielle. And if you, if you covered this, I'm sorry to nope, <laughs> repeat it. But, um, so we have the state boundary, right? Like I just showed you with New York. And then we have that buffer zone within the, in, on the inside of the boundary. 
But the buffer zone is dynamic, meaning it's a different distance depending on the data source that we use, right? Yeah. The buffer zone, did you cover that? Yeah, cover that. Okay. So like Gabrielle said, you know, if, you, if we can get down to GPS, that buffer zone becomes very, very small. Um, now, bear in mind, we also build out, there's all kinds of other things that go into this, obviously, but we have to build out things, especially in states like New York, like uh, railway buffer zones for, for all the trains leaving the state, right? We have to uh, factor in airports and, you know, make sure we block, uh, you know, Southwest Wi-Fi, for example. Um, we have to, we look at roadways, we look at speed limits, right? If somebody's on uh, in, in uh, Tennessee, Interstate 40 goes into Arkansas and, you know, the speed limits uh, is 65, 70, whatever it is. Um, actually we just did, we just built the, the shape off of Arkansas because they passed statewide mobile. And when I say shape file, we're just talking about the map, right? The boundary, um, and their speed limit's 75. And so, you know, we have to do some calculations on the interstates that are leaving the state and create a, an, an actual buffer zone on the interstate itself, uh, which could be quite large compared to what, you know, your, your GPS buffer zone might be if you're just, if you're standing still. So we detect movement as well. Um, we just had an interesting use case because Puerto Rico, as Gabrielle mentioned, is um, getting ready to launch. The date keeps moving, but it looks like it's going to be maybe sometime in April. Um, and it was actually probably it, since I've been with GeoComply, the easiest uh, territory or jurisdiction that we've had to create that shape file for, right? Because it's basically, hey, nine nautical miles just draw a circle around the islands. I think there's four islands that comprise Puerto Rico. It could be five. I can't remember. But um, but then we had to actually look and be like, okay, we don't have to create any railway or roadway buffer zones, clearly, because you can't leave Puerto Rico by rail or car. Uh, but we do have to uh, look at speed limits for boats, right? Like what? how fast can somebody actually leave that nine nautical mile uh, area that comprises Puerto Rico's jurisdiction? Um, so we just had, you know, sort of an interesting internal conversation on, okay, what's, how fast can boats go, right? Like, are we talking about cruise ships? Well, no, I mean, there's speed boats too, right? Um, so we factor in all those things um, when we look at buffer zones. But again, in my experience, we actually have more issues with rural areas. Um, and we actually have more issues with um, states that offer iGaming. And the reason is pretty simple. Actually, it makes common sense. Um, most people prefer to play, you know, if you're in a poker game, uh, blackjack or so, some of the games that, that go on for a while, they prefer to play on a desktop or a PC, right? Where they've got a bigger screen versus their phone. Well, desktops or PC limit our data sources really to Wi-Fi triangulation. Um, so and if you're in a rural area, it's hard to triangulate on, on multiple Wi-Fi access points. So that, that's usually where we have, you know, the player friction issues. One of the other um, stories or, or um kind of examples that we we've used a lot and um, it's it's less um, because New York has passed it's you know it is now legalized statewide mobile sports wagering we used to always show the map of New Jersey because it shares such a close border with Manhattan where there's just such large you know areas of traffic um, and I, I believe Danny correct me if I'm wrong 80 percent of New Jersey's mobile betting traffic occurs within like five miles of the border of yeah, New Jersey. No, that's true. All yeah. of like so much of their traffic is so close to the state border. So we typically, when we were you know, showing the pin drop map and giving these examples before New York legalized, we would zoom in to that river border between New Jersey and New York, right where Manhattan is. And there's the bridge that goes across. And there were articles that would come out where um, people would bike across the bridge to New Jersey place their bet, get geolocated, pass the transaction, place their bet and go back to Manhattan um, because that border is so close. But also what our technology can do with the right, you know, when it can gather the right information to, to be that accurate is, you know, we're, we're passing transactions right up to that river, right there. I mean, we're getting, we're allowing um, or the operator is allowing, we don't decide whether they can place a bet, but the operator is allowing, because of our technology, allowing those users that are that close to the border to be able to place a bet because our technology can, can accurately identify that they are within the state of New Jersey. 
Okay. So look, you, you found it? Oh, I, yeah, I have it up. I was just waiting. Okay. Uh, uh, are there any other questions or should I just proceed to this demo? You can go ahead and we will, um, you know, well, type your type your questions in the chat or, or raise your okay. hand again and I'll, I'll interrupt, but go ahead, Danny. All right, so Alex, your question actually made me made me think of, of, of this visual, which I think is pretty powerful. Um, and this this visual uh, basically depicts every time somebody from outside the United States um, tried to make it look like their IP address was actually inside the United States. So this is IP address. If we if we relied on that as as a geolocation source, would would make it appear they were in the United States. But there, the actual other data sources that we use to locate a device um, told us definitively that that device was outside of the United States. Um, so you can see, I mean, there's this is 410,000, right? In it looks like, you know, the New York, New Jersey area right there. Uh, there's and this is the time frame for this is just in the past seven days. So this is all wagering traffic in the United States. This would be representative of sports books and iGaming platforms. Um, and you can see from all over the world on a daily basis, uh, probably hundreds of times a day, um, people are trying to make it look like they're in the United States just based on IP. Could be VPNs, could be proxy, could be Torque, whatever. Um, this, this is what we combat on a daily basis. Um, these people in, in some, some means are far more sophisticated than, than just an IP spoof. Um, but this is why we cannot rely on IP addresses to geolocate a device. It gets even a little scarier when you start looking at like OFAC sanctioned regions. And so we'll just look at Russia. And I'll take the time period out to 30 days and see what we come up with. So uh, 200 times, 85 unique devices, 87 different account numbers or usernames on either sports books or iGaming platforms in the past 30 days. Somebody in Russia has tried to make it appear like they are in the United States uh, based off of IP. Uh, and we have definitively located that device inside uh, the country of Russia. So this is, again, just an example of uh, what we combat um, some of the visuals and data that we have um, to show, you know, our operators, uh, legislators, whoever, um, regulators, what, what the threats that we face are. Um, and again, we, we look at, we see more sophisticated means um, than what you're seeing on this screen. But I think this is a, a nice visual to show how attractive this market is um, for, for fraudsters. Uh, and this is, uh, th this, when I said 99.9% .9 of all people that are, are trying to wager are, are doing so legitimately, uh, this would represent part of the 0.1%. Um, most of these people are Ooh. trying to attack these platforms uh, to commit bonus abuse or credit card fraud. Okay, we have a question from Alex. If you want okay. to yourself, go ahead and ask Alex. Is it the same Alex or a different Alex? It's the same Alex. Yeah, the same same one. I had a follow up question based on this graphic, um, which was is really interesting. Um, so, was there any, I guess, rhyme or reason as to why, like, where? specifically in the u.s like they're like spoofing their location to like what states like you mentioned there was you know that huge number in like the new york new jersey area like is there any i guess pattern or reason as to why you're seeing certain areas be so much more than maybe other states that have legalized you know sports betting or other things yeah it's it's strange because um Usually, we, we do see the bulk of the activity in states where uh, wait some some form of online wagering is legal. Uh, in this particular case, I, I can I can see right now, and you guys probably can too. I mean, I see a couple in Texas. I see some in California. There's no eye gaming and or, or sports wagering in, in either of those states. Um, so I I really can't explain that. Um, but I will say, you know, I don't know. It could be trial and error. Um, it could be something other than simply using a VPN where they're not really certain. Like it could be a tour network maybe, and they're not really sure where that tour exit node is. Um, and they're just going to repeatedly try until they get lucky. Um, I, and, and I'm, I'm sort of guessing out loud at this point. Um, but just because 
their IP made it look somewhat made it look like they were in the United States, but their uh, our other data sources definitively located them in Russia. Doesn't mean it's strictly a VPN. There are, there are other methods um, where you can uh, mask your your true IP, um, and 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 I'm guessing it could be like a Tor exit node where they're not really sort, certain where it's going to come out. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, awesome. I'm going to stop sharing unless there's any other questions on that graphic. I am going to talk real quick. If I can find this. Wait, am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Okay, let's see. I think it's this one. Can you see the the mirror, Gabrielle? Um, I see the Kibana dashboard. Does it say 24? Yep. Okay. All right. Just real quick, um, we've got a lot of different visuals that we use. We basically when we we come, uh, I told you that we did over 350 checks when we when we geolocated device. That results in us having a lot of data, right, on every geolocation transactions. Uh, Super Bowl weekend. We did like 80 something million geolocation transactions. We were averaging like 8,000 a second at one point across the United States. Um, multiply that by 350 per transaction and we've got volumes of data. Uh, one of the things we've learned is that aggregating that data and examining it um, is, is really a powerful, powerful indicator of fraud and also powerful to help regulators and law enforcement investigate you know, those sophisticated attempts to violate the Federal Wire Act, proxy betting cases, credit card fraud, identity theft, all that stuff. Uh, our data is extremely powerful in that. So I just wanted to show you real quick, one of the ways that we, we aggregate that data for anti-fraud purposes is to look at how many different accounts are being accessed from a single device, right? Um, Courtney, since I can see you, uh, in the past seven days, which is what this time frame is set at, you can see right here, how many different people have you shared your cell phone with? Like maybe one. Maybe one, right? So if I'm seeing 24 over here, I would have to believe that somebody shared their cell phone with 24 different people in the past seven days so that they could all log into the same sports book with their login credentials, right? To, and place a wager and then give the phone back to the owner. It's just, it, it's, it's, it's inexplicable, it's irrational. Uh, if it's not normal behavior, it's abnormal behavior. Abnormal behavior in this space means fraud. Um, so it's probably one person opening up all these accounts. Uh, either it's identity theft, right? They bought 24 different identities. They got to open up 24 accounts and maybe try and get a deposit match um, or a free bet or whatever it might be. Credit card fraud sometimes uh, you see on this, uh, in this respect. Um, and then one other thing I'll show you is that we can actually go and look at the exact location, obviously, where that those transactions occurred. If I filtered by that device, so I'm going to filter by this device UUID, which is this unique identifier here. And then once it populates, I'll actually be able to see exactly where this fraudulent contract is occurring. By zooming in, where these red dots are, almost like the pin drop map, except red doesn't mean failure in this case, it just means this is where the device was. And so we can see right here, if I hover, get in a little bit further, it's in the Philadelphia area. This is 113 geolocation transactions occurred in that spot out of 170. So I can tell you right now, based on my experience investigating fraud, that whoever's perpetrating this fraud scheme either lives or works right there. And I can zoom in all the way down to like the house level. So in law enforcement and investigations, this is pretty powerful. I literally have, uh, in about 30 seconds, identified where the suspect probably lives or works. 
that's committing this fraud. Um, in my old career with the Secret Service, uh, investigating credit card fraud, money laundering, identity theft, all those things that I investigated for years, this might have taken me months with subpoenas and, you know, looking at surveillance video and pulling trash in the middle of the night, trying to figure out if this is the person or not. Um, again, 30 seconds. Here you go, law enforcement. Here's a solid lead for you. This is fraud. It occurred right from this residence. Go do your thing. Um, so, so that's just, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say, well, Courtney has, uh, she typed in the chat, would you give this information to law enforcement officials for them to follow up on? So the, not, not directly to law enforcement um, voluntarily, we provide these in, this type of information to our customers, which are the operators. When we identify these things, um, when we put these types of reports together, they go to our customers because, again, as you're seeing, we have anonymized data, right? We don't have the player information. We don't have their email, their address, their anything like that. We're, you know, attached to where these geolocation transactions are occurring. So we provide the information to our operators um, voluntarily, right? Like we, we freely give that information. However, when we are asked to by law enforcement to provide this information as part of an investigation, usually through like a subpoena or some kind of formal request, um, they, then, then yes, we, we do work with law enforcement. We have cooperated with them in the past. We continue to, um, I remember you, you, like early on in my time when I gave my first presentation to Tennessee Lottery, ironically, before Danny came on, um, there was a, a, an example that we would give of, um, you know, we provided data to law enforcement for um, a fraud investigation where they found, you know, as Danny was saying, multiple users on, on one device is, is really abnormal. 24 is way abnormal. Average, you know, three to five, anything three to five or less, we don't really kind of freak out about. Anything above that is, is definitely then, you know, going towards the, the fraud, the fraud side, um, or identity theft or, or something like that. There were almost a thousand different accounts associated with one location and one device, um, that they were investigating. So that of course was definitely identity fraud. Yeah. Um, and so we do, we do provide the information to law enforcement, but through our general findings, like, like what Danny was showing you, that would go to the operator that would go to our customer yeah. for them to take that information. And typically, you know, they're the first ones contacted by law enforcement when they're doing an investigation, because they have more of the, the player or user data than we do. Um, but they will come to us for specific geolocation information as well when they need it. Yeah, and also like the dashboard that I just showed you um, is in our database. Um, we also provide this free of charge to state regulators, right? So they're able to see this as well. Uh, our philosophy is, um, you know, obviously we wanna be business friendly, um, but we also as a whole want this industry to succeed, right? So the more fraudsters we can keep out, the better off everybody will be, whether it's, you know, state revenue, uh, our, our clients, and even us at, at some point, right? Um, so regulators get this free of charge, so they can also uh, identify fraud. And we feel like the more eyes that are on it, the better. Um, and then ultimately, everybody has to work together, right, to stop it, whether it's operators working with regulators, regulators working with law enforcement it's got to be a combination of all of our data that's really going to solve this. Like I just told you, okay, you know, here's the house where this fraudulent conduct is going on. But what I can't tell you is what type of fraud this is. I can speculate. And based on my experience, I'll probably be right, but it's certainly not good enough for a court of law. Right. I mean, if somebody's going to actually investigate this from a law enforcement perspective, they need to know what the crime is. And in order to know what the crime is, if it's identity theft, you have to know, the PII behind all 24 of those accounts, because ultimately you've got to eventually talk to the victim of identity theft and say, Hey, did you open this account on, you know, X sports book or not? Right. And they can't get that from us. Like Gabrielle said, they have to go to the sports book itself to get that. So everybody kind of has to work together. Um, but the first we give real time alerts to all of our clients when we see stuff like this. Um, so that at least I, I, initially we can shut the accounts down and then figure out where we're going to go from there. Lewis, you have a question. 
Hey guys, um, I just want to say I remember when I, I moved to this country from England trying to get on BBC iPlayer to watch the uh, the English soccer. Highlight. You're welcome, Lewis. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks guys. Cheers. Uh, not available in this country. Um, but as, as well, I was, I was just going to ask, like I imagine since PASPA went down, you know, the need for geolocations obviously shot up. Um, is there anything in the future that you can see having like any contingency where geolocation would be like, you know, really necessary? Would it be really necessary or unnecessary? Really? So in terms of like uh, a sort of uh, something happening in the future where like, you know, the need for geolocation would shoot right up? Yeah. Um, first of all, Greg, I want to compliment your class. These are really good questions. Um, yeah. So I don't know, Gabrielle, if you want to take a stab at that or you want me, I'll just say real briefly, um, when we have when we have conversations about the future and as it relates to, you know, the overturning of PASPA and all this stuff, generally, you know, we, we talk about, well, you know, what would happen if someday the Federal Wire Act were repealed, right? which really is uh, the Federal Wire Act, UG, as Gabrielle talked about, I mean, it's kind of why we exist right now. Um, there are a ton of other applications for our, our data and our, and our solutions. Um, but the way that everything is unfolding and being structured on a state-by-state -state basis right now, um, even if the Federal Wire Act were overturned tomorrow, um, I don't the need for geolocation would still exist for a couple of reasons. One, for the anti-fraud purposes we just talked about. And our clients fully recognize the value that we bring in that space. And two, um, I don't think states are going to want to give up their piece of the pie in terms of the tax, the individual tax revenue they're scraping off of these gaming activities. Um, so I think they're still going to want to know, you know, hey, we're, we're going to limit wagering to our state so that we can get our piece of the revenue. Well, and, and in that same regard, Danny, um, you know, even if, if federally they say, sure, whatever, do it across state borders. Number one, I agree. These states are getting a lot of tax money on the online gaming and sports betting markets. But I, I also fully believe there are states like Utah who are never going to want to allow online sure, gambling in their state. Um, and so, you know, even if other states agreed to, to accept, you know, states across state borders, there's probably always going to be states um, to that, that don't want it in their state and would still have to be geofenced up. And Greg makes a good point. Even if the Federal Wire Act is repealed, the Illegal Gambling Business Act would still make geolocation relevant. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that would as well. But Lewis, to go back to your question, I don't know if you're talking about maybe other verticals outside of gaming. Um, you know, we, we focus this on, on gaming today because that, that's just obviously that class. But our company does, we support other vertical streaming. Um, we're, we're supporting crypto customers, fintech. Um, we work really closely with, you know, the federal government and, um, you know, banking legislation, fintech. We have a team in not in a kind of a non-gaming area of our business that's really focusing on that and how we can support um, you know, those industries with the technology that we have. Um, on a humanitarian side, we were have worked with um agencies that that um, combat child trafficking or human trafficking. And um, so there's a need for the technology that, that we have across so many different industries um, yeah. already. And so really at this point, we're just exploring what we can do and how much of a difference our technology can make in those sectors. Yeah, uh, Lewis, we're probably the ones that, that blocked you from watching uh, your soccer matches. <laughs> Um, there's, there's a, uh, there's a huge need for, for that in the, in the media, in the entertainment space. And a lot of it actually has to do with their, their commercial contracts, right. And, um, the agreements they have with their content providers as to where they can offer programming and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but just to speak real quick about the crypto space, because that's seems to be right now outside of gaming where, um, the need for our services is quickly growing. And um, it comes from more of a compliance standpoint where crypto companies, whether it's uh, a wallet or a crypto exchange, they will not necessarily um, care about, I shouldn't say care, that's the wrong word. They, they, 
they're really focusing on making sure they are maintaining compliance. And so uh, what we're doing in that space right now is a lot of geofencing. Um, we have crypto uh, companies that are outside the United States that don't want to be licensed in the United States. They don't want to go through the hoops. They don't want to pay the fees. Um, so they're asking us to geofence out certain states in the United States where nobody can transact within on that exchange from the state of New York, for example, because they just don't want to go through the licensing hassle. But they also don't want to get in trouble either. Um, and then they're using us to geofence out like OFAC sanctioned regions, um, Russia, uh, Crimea, wherever it is, Syria, Iran, North Korea, um, so that they can maintain compliance with OFAC because they the crypto space is evolving so quickly that I don't, I'm not sure that anybody really understands five years from now uh, what sort of regulations are going to be in place. And, and, and there's probably going to be multiple federal agencies that are regulating different aspects of crypto, whether it's the SEC, uh, the U.S. Treasury or a combination thereof. Is it an investment? Is it a currency? What is it? Um, so all that stuff's still unfolding. And there are crypto companies now that are recognizing if they're in this for the long term, they better get on the right side of compliance, no matter where, what agency it, it's going to fall under. I love these questions. Seriously, the you guys um, challenging and, and, and really fun to answer um, quickly, just throwing it out there. Um, we do have an internship program with our company across not just legal, but um, all different um, departments, uh, software, DevOps. We have like a crypto internship right now um, that I know they've, they've been filling. Um, we're, we're getting close to filling most of our internships for the summer right now, but, um, still have some of them open. So if you go to our website, which I can drop in the chat, um, you can navigate to the careers page and, um, oh, I sent that only to Greg. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You can navigate to our careers page and it has all of our open positions lifted, listed, including our internships. You'll see job descriptions for all of them. You can apply directly through our website. Um, and, and we do this ongoing, right? It's not a one-time thing. We have um, internships typically every summer. We love our interns. We do not treat interns like uh, grunt workers who just get us coffee. We really value um, the learning experience and you, you guys, you know, our interns get to dive in with us and do what we do and learn what we're doing. Um, I'm hiring a regulatory compliance intern, um, which can be a law student or, or can be an undergrad. It could go either way, but you would work directly with me and um, licensing due diligence. Um, our company is pre-IPO. You know, Some of that work might be starting this year uh, to do the, the regulatory side of, of IPO prep. So there's there's a ton of learning opportunities in our company. Um, we, we love our interns. So this year, next year, future years, if you or anyone you know is interested in an internship with our company, please always check our website. We constantly update our open positions um, and what we're looking for. And just to add on to that, uh, I'm also hiring a government relations intern and my intern literally is going to be doing regulatory analysis of, of, of wagering regulations across the country, gap analysis of those regulations. Um, the the my intern is going to be uh, with me in meetings with 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 state regulators um, for iGaming sports wagering. Um, they're going to participate in all of that. Um, and just really to drive this nail home, uh, I work right now with a lot of former GeoComply interns that are now on our staff. Um, these people came back multiple summers um, and and got hired right out of right out of school. Um, so. We do take it very seriously. Uh, I don't think I, I've worked for the government my whole career, so um, it's I'm not really the best example. But uh, this this is a very serious intern program. They really look at it as an opportunity to identify talent that we want to hire. That's that's why we have it. It is a paid internship, in case anybody and it's, yes, was it's wondering paid. and didn't want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so, are there any more questions from the, the class on anything? I know it was a lot of information, um, but it, it is recorded, so you guys can watch it again. Anyone who missed it can, can certainly watch it. And um, Greg has our contact information with our emails. You're free to reach out to us with questions about anything you have with what we presented or the career opportunities or, or anything like that. It's a fantastic product. It really is. Thank I mean, you. The, the, the amount of information you're collecting uh, from from your APIs and, and 
in system is staggering. It's it's impressive, and it as you said, it's got it has application even beyond uh, just making sure transactions or, or betters are in the state that they should be in when they place wagers. You know that having a UUID and the the MAC address is key for fraud yep. issues. Um, so that, that again, that's really impressive. Yeah, and just to be clear on one thing too, Greg, just um, we we do not do any marketing with a, with the data we collect. Uh, it is not used at all for marketing purposes. There are other geolocation companies out there that do do that, uh, and we do not. We are strictly compliance, anti fraud. That's all we do. Yep, that is impressive. Quick question for you, Danny, before before we leave. Uh, yes, sir. Do you think it's a, a, Beneficial for jurisdictions to regulate or license or register uh, geolocation vendors, or yes. is it better that it's that it's an unregulated? Uh, yeah. Component of this? It, yeah, and I and I will say this both as a geocomply employee and a former state regulator of, of mobile wagering in Tennessee, um, it is absolutely uh, whether you call it a registration, a license, whatever. Um, there should be some vetting of geolocation service providers. Uh, and the, the reason is, is there are several reasons. One, that we're an integral part of, of wagering, right? Um, just because and some states will say, uh, well, you don't have any access to PII. You don't touch the player's wallet. Um, so you're really not an integral part of the wagering system. Well, that's to me, that's malarkey uh, to use a famous word that seems to be going around these days, right? I mean, how do you say that geolocation, which is the number one compliance tool in, in sports wagering, mobile or gaming in the country, is not an integral part of wagering? Um, so we should, geolocation companies should be registered or licensed because they should be vetted. And that's what in, is involved in that process, right? Um, and then I, lastly, I'll speak to the second side of that, which is they absolutely have to be tested. They should be subject to independent test lab certification. Um, so that regulators can be certain that the geolocation technology uh, either meets or exceeds the geolocation standards they've incorporated in their regulations. And, and to add on to what Danny's saying from the licensing perspective, um, we're, you know, most companies are like, oh, I don't want to get licensed. It's such a pain. And, and I'm sure, you know, you guys being in the gaming lacrosse have, have discussed the licensing process. Um, with different regulators, we actually want to be licensed. We talked to, you know, um, Iowa for the longest time was like, yeah, we don't need you. It's fine. We don't need you to be licensed. It's cool. Just do your services. It's fine. They changed their regulations. And, and a week ago, it went into effect. And they explicitly now say geolocation service providers have to be licensed. Um, so we're going through that process right now. I'm in discussions with um, another jurisdiction that's getting ready to, is starting licensing and getting ready to come online. And, and they've classified us as like a non-gaming vendor and, and have given us reasons why. And we've pushed back and said, but this isn't accurate, right? We are integral. And they, you know, there's like language that they want us to attest to with an affidavit of, you know, we don't connect to the platform, you know, the non-gaming vendors are prohibited from connecting to the sports wagering platform. And I called them and I said, we can't sign this because we do. Because this is, you know, you're classifying us this way, but the standards you have for this level are not like, and so a lot of it is education mm -hmm. for the regulator because this is such a unique and new technology to this world. And so our company, Danny, Lindsay, you know, Chad, like this whole team and, and myself occasionally, we get in front of the regulator and we do as much education as we can to get them to understand what we do, how we integrate, what role we play in this entire process, because sometimes they just don't quite understand it enough for them to be able to make the decision that they probably need to be making regarding yeah. our licensing or regarding how they view our technology. Um, and so we, we work hard to, to just create that communication relationship as well. Thank you. Yeah. Great questions, you guys. I uh, really appreciate you being engaged. Yep. Especially at a 7.30 class. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we tend to get a fairly dedicated group of students if they're willing to sign up. Yes. 7.25 a.m. class. Yes, 100%. You know As you want you know. to be in this class. <laughs>
Uh, Gabrielle, Danny, thank you so much for presenting Pleasure. today. Greatly appreciate it. It's great information, great company, fabulous product. Thanks again. And I would encourage anybody that's interested in uh, this area to apply for an internship with Definitely. GeoComply. I think you'll learn a lot. They truly are the market leader in this space. And it's not real close. Let's let's be honest. Um, and it's it, it, it's a powerful product, and it's only going to get more and more important as iGaming and sports wagering expand in the United States. So thank thanks you. for having us, Greg. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.